Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Digital Peace Building Community of Practice. We are going to get started in just a few minutes. Thank you for joining us. Everybody, do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like, just so we can get a sense for who's here in the room, what organization you're affiliated with, or if you're just independent. For those of you just joining, welcome. We're going to get started in about a minute. Huh? Hi, hi, Erica. Hi, Sally. Okay, I'm going to start um, just before we get we kick off the session of everybody if you're not speaking just please mute your microphone so there's less background noise. Um, and we can begin. So hi everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Sarosky. I'm a manager for communications campaigns and policy at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. You're at the October session of AFP's Digital Peacebuilding Community of Practice. Um, the Community of Practice is co-led by AFP, Mercy Corps, the Total Peace Institute, and Search for Common Ground. We are an open community of practice that aims to harness digital tools to analyze and respond to online conflict dynamics and amplify peacebuilding outcomes. If anyone here is joining for the first time, Please feel free to email me if you'd like to be added to the mailing list for the community of practice. I will drop my email address in the chat shortly. And please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, like I said earlier, so we can get a sense of who's tuning in today and from where. I'm very excited today to welcome our guest presenter, Patrick Meyer. Patrick is co-founder and co-CEO of We Robotics, an organization that over the past six plus years has worked with hundreds of local experts and dozens of local organizations in more than 35 countries to collectively expand the space for locally led action and the use of emerging technologies for positive social impact. Together, they continue to shift the power in favor of local expertise, leadership, and lived experience. Patrick is an expert in enabling local experts to build their capacity and expertise in the use of emerging technologies. Today's session will explore how local experts are using drones, robotics, and AI to tackle aid, development, health, and environmental challenges, the ins and outs of the demand-driven localization model that We Robotics continues to co-create, and why international organizations need to measure their power footprints to drive systems change. Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, thank you for kindly organizing. Thank you all for spending some of your time today on uh, this webinar. I'm really looking forward to this engagement. I mentioned to Nick that I'm always excited to have the opportunity to share across different disciplines. I'm certainly not an expert on digital peace building, but intrigued. And I deeply believe that there's a lot that we all can learn from each other in these different um, to start with, maybe just a few words about uh, We Robotics. We're a small uh, nonprofit social impact organization, and our mission is to partner with with local experts, proximate leaders, local organizations, activists, commun uh, communities to offer practical alternatives to systems that are dominated by foreign-led top-down interventions. And I'm gonna share with you um, in a very concrete example of just one such uh, practical uh, alternative. Um, before I do that, to set the context, um, it's a very exciting time right now in the robotics space, uh, robotics and AI, as you uh, no doubt know. Uh, and what we are starting to see in terms of trends is we're at the same place 
Now we were a couple of decades ago when we started making that leap from the last feature phone to the very first smartphone. And you know how much of a massive fee change that was uh, on society and so on, right? And right now I can tell you that in the robotic space in terms of intelligent and autonomous systems, we are just making that leap now. In fact, you can think of a panther or tiger, you know, two paws up, two paws still on the ground and doing that leap, that, that's where we're at. So it really is an exciting time. And as other experts uh, who have been in this or far longer than I have, have said, uh, of the drone industry and the robotics industry and, and, and tech, uh, you know, emerging tech in general, um, we are on the very edge of exponential growth um, in, in the drone industry, robotics drone industry. And it has a potential to transform our lives for the better. And that has got to be a goal um, that's worth working towards. I fully agree with that particular sentiment. Uh, these are exciting times. At the same time, and you're hearing a but, um, we really, 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 really need to unpack a lot of this stuff um, because who exactly is on the edge of exponential growth? Um, whose lives are going to be transformed for the better? Who gets to lead that particular transformation for better lives? Who gets to be called the expert and have access to the exponential technology in the first place? The who is almost always missing from these kinds of uh, conversations. And so while we're at a very exciting space in time for the robotics industry about to make a huge leap forward that will absolutely reshape society, the fact of the matter is we are in the stone age when it comes to social justice and the technology for good space. I mean, and that's already maybe being too kind in terms of, of where we are. Uh, as, far as, as far as social justice, um, which is why you get pictures like this. Now, this was from seven years ago in the South Pacific after a massive cyclone, right? But you still see these kinds of pictures uh, today where you have the foreigner that parachutes in with the latest emerging technology, in this case, drones, and the local community is at best a passive observer, right? And in this case, you have even uh, you know, a local community member holding the umbrella so that the foreign white drone pilot doesn't get wet while flying his drone, right? Um, this is unfortunately the, the, the reality of a lot of the technology for uh, good space. And we want to absolutely change that completely and turn it upside down um, uh, as much as possible. And the way we do that is with something called the Flying Labs Network. And that is, the, an example of that very practical alternative that we've been busy co-creating and co-building with several dozen local organizations uh, around the world. Flying labs are simply independent and locally led knowledge hubs that combine local leadership and local expertise with emerging technologies in order to drive positive social change. And these flying labs are all connected with each other. There are now 38 labs across the world. They share best practices and lessons learned. Um, they train together, they train each other, they team up on joint projects um, uh, as well. And they're also directly connected with, within their own ecosystems in their countries and in their uh, regions uh, as well. And just to give you an idea that there are some faces behind these dots on the map, these are some of the team members across the Flying Labs network, A very diverse group of individuals with just, I mean, every single discipline seems to be represented across the Flying Labs network. A lot of different domain expertise and experience, just a wealth, a wealth of, of knowledge that they all bring together uh, to each other, to, to the network. Um, and, you know, the way that we have co-created the Flying Labs network is by co-creating a, you could call it a localization model, you could call it a decentralization model, a <laughs> the power model, you know, you know choose your, your, your favorite term, um, but we've had to build by doing. And I would um, love for you to have a, a skim um, of this particular report that was co-authored with many flying labs earlier this year that goes into the details and nuts and bolts of how this, um, this localization, decentralization model actually works in practice. It is packed full of evidence and details uh, and, and so on. 
for the purposes of now, I'm just going to tease out some of the key kind of features of this model that we refer to as the inclusive networks model. Uh, first of all, this model doesn't ask, demand, require that uh, local organizations uh, create a new entity in order to be a flying labs. Flying labs are hosted by existing locally owned, locally managed entities that already have a track record in this specific area of technology and uh, social good. They are completely independently led and managed. There is no we robotics staff that is part of a flying labs. This never happened, will never happen. Um, they are financially independent. When these organizations join the Flying Labs Network, they already have clients, they already have uh, business opportunities, they have a track record, they have partners and, and so on. Flying Labs are also entirely demand driven. Um, we as We Robotics don't tell Flying Labs what projects to work on, who to partner with, how to set up their own team, how to manage their time, Yada yada yada. This is entirely independently led and independently uh, managed um, it, based on the priorities and interests of the Flying Labs themselves. And the idea of the Flying Labs brand and identity is to help amplify the expertise and visibility um, of the whole organization. The idea is not to take the Flying Labs network and the brand and erase the local organizations that are actually hosting it. It's very much a beautiful symbiotic relationship. The success of Flying Labs is entirely dependent on the success of the hosting organizations and the success of the hosting organization is also then dependent on, on the success of the Flying Labs. Um, we celebrate that individuality and the fact that uh, these labs are hosted by, by local organizations. Uh, we also celebrate local ways of being, local knowledge, local leadership and so on. These are not just check boxes, they are celebrated actively across the Flying Labs network. We also don't tell anyone to join the Flying Labs network. Uh, organizations will join if they see that there's value to them and they can leave at any time. There's no gatekeeping here, right? Um, and something I recently learned from a colleague of mine who's been working in the INGO UN space for decades. He said, you know, when we close up shop, when we close down a country office, it ain't ever coming back. That's it. We close up shop, it's done, the organization moves. What's interesting about the Flying Labs model is even when a hosting organization decides, you know what, we've gotten as much value as we wanted from being part of the Flying Labs network, we are now off to do uh, bigger and better things. That doesn't mean that that particular country will never have a Flying Labs again. In fact, then that Flying Labs becomes available to other local organizations to host and run as well. And we actually have examples of that happening uh, multiple times uh, as well. So there's that continuity. In terms of our role as an enabler of the Flying Labs Network, we're involved in helping to facilitate knowledge exchange between uh, all these Flying Labs and between industry and the Flying Labs. We also are involved in accelerating the transfer of emerging technologies from industry to the Flying Labs, but always in function of the priorities and needs and interests of the Flying Labs, right? It's always them being in the driver's seat. We are simply an enabler. And then um, we're also involved in something we call um, opportunity transfer because we've seen time and time again, even in my experience before we robotics, that even when local organizations have the skills, have the experience and have the technologies, they're still discriminated against. They're still overlooked by international organizations, companies, but even by their own governments who instead of hiring local experts in their own countries will decide to hire the experts in Canada, the company in England, the consulting group in Australia to fly halfway across the world and, and show how it's done, right? So opportunity transfer refers to us as a, as a small uh, Western organization using our contacts and our reach to reroute opportunities that will typically go to the usual suspects in the global north and route them right back to Flying Labs and their many local partners in country and within um, the region. To try and give you now a bit more concrete and perhaps maybe less abstract in terms of what Flying Labs are involved in, they work across multiple different programs or sectors from humanitarian action to sustainable development, youth and STEM education, public health, uh, environmental issues from nature conservation to wildlife protection to climate change. 
uh, climate crisis mitigation, as well as business entrepreneurship, uh, incubating locally owned, locally managed uh, startups in, in their own countries. And to give you even more of a concrete example of what this all looks like, um, for example, in disaster recovery, you remember my colleague from Australia here on, on the left, um, uh, a, a, a few years after that, uh, when uh, Fiji Flying Labs joined the network, the head of Fiji Flying Labs was asked by the Fijian Red Cross to deploy with them after a tropical cyclone in order to assess the damage to some outer inhabited islands. And the head of Fiji Flying Labs had two hours to get their drone packed, their gear packed to be self-sufficient for at least a week um, and, and work with the Red Cross to carry out these assessments. Uh, in contrast, my colleague, my Australian colleague on the left needed three weeks in order to get to the South Pacific and start uh, operating the drones. So that's a big difference. Not only that, but the head, uh, form, former head of, of, um, of Fiji Flying Labs is Amrita uh, right here, um, who not only was the first woman in her country to be a, a certified professional drone pilot, but then was also the first woman in her country to be involved in, and, and requested and sought out to apply her technical uh, and professional expertise to support humanitarian efforts in her, first, in her own country, right? And because of her good work and uh, uh, she received a prestigious award being uh, named uh, one of the women to watch in the drone industry in 2019. And very luckily uh, um, for us, um, uh, Amrita has since joined We Were Bikes full time to lead uh, the STEM program uh, entirely across the Flying Labs network. So that is, a, if you want, in a picture, what we're all about, going from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. Now, in terms of disaster response, Nepal Flying Labs was actually the first to join the network in 2015, and they did so uh, in the aftermath of the major earthquake that happened there in, in 2015. They were uh, uh, yet to be a Flying Labs, but uh, Nepali colleagues were keen to know how to best use uh, drone technology to accelerate the recovery efforts. And so we were involved um, to, in, in knowledge exchange, technology transfer, uh, and so on. Uh, and the Nepali team did all the drone flights and uh, mapping. They printed the maps that were generated by these drones on these large rollable banners, bringing them back to the local communities and engaging with directly with the local communities on what is called community mapping or also public participatory GIS, enabling the local community to take ownership over the discussions with respect to priorities for rebuilding and recovery, as well as the strategies um, involved, right? This was not an outside organization saying, this is how it's gonna be done. Thanks to this map and this common kind of uh, uh, information layer uh, and these methods around uh, participatory GIS, you enable, they enabled the community to take direct ownership. And then just a few years after that, Nepal Flying Labs was contracted by the United Nations to be the ones training their country teams in, in Nepal on how to use drones for disaster management in professional, responsible, effective ways, right? They are now the recognized experts in their own country and being sought after. And again, so, this is another picture to show you. This is what we're all about. Starting with the flying labs in the aftermath of a major disaster to basically then having the flying labs be the go-to uh, team uh, and organization uh, for this kind of work and, and a lot more. Uh, other side of the planet, planet uh, Panama Flying Labs has been involved in work focused on the, the, the climate emergency, uh, climate risk mitigation. They've been looking at the impact of sea level rise on islands. Uh, Panamanian islands and what you can do with this kind of imagery is do some pretty sophisticated you know modeling and to understand just what gets flooded when depending on the level of sea level rise and so on. In addition Panama Flying Labs has been involved in mangrove restoration. Uh, mangroves are extremely important to uh, trying to respond to the climate emergency. They absorb four times more carbon dioxide than any other living plant on the planet. They're also, as you can see from the video on the lower left, extremely important for mitigating floods, uh, storms, um, soil erosion, and, and so on. So we've worked with Panama Flying Labs because one of the challenges um, with mangrove restoration is, is actually 
planting new mangroves in areas that are very difficult or nearly impossible to access physically. So we experimented with them by using drones. So the drone you see in the top left is actually carrying many, many, many uh, mangrove seeds and using the drone to then basically plant mangroves and trying to mimic what mother nature does when a seed falls off the top of a mangrove tree and goes into the soil, the very soft, wet soil. Um, and this project then we turned into opportunity for youth and STEM education. We turned this project into a picture book uh, for children. We worked with um, uh, very talented uh, illustrators and, and editors from the region and the country to bring this particular story to life. Uh, because what we had seen um, is that you know, more and more flying labs are engaged in, in, in STEM and youth education. Um, and they wanted to have picture books that they can use as part of their, of their, as their, their work with youth. But we looked at all these picture books that exist, the few that exist on drones and so on. And as you can guess, they're written by Western authors, illustrated by Western illustrators. And of course, the you know, protagonists of the stories are white boys and girls, uh, predominantly white boys, right? And that was going to be a complete deal breaker and no-go for us because we wanted uh, these kids to be able to see themselves in these books, to recognize that, hey, this, this, is, this can be me, right? And so uh, this was tremendously successful, more than we expected. Not only could these um, youth see themselves in the book, this is uh, in a very rural school in, in Panama, um, but the team from Panama Flying Labs were the main characters in the books as well, because they were the main characters leading the projects in real life. So not only could these kids see themselves in the book, but they could see the, the team from Panama, Panama Flying Labs that was literally training them on how to fly drones for the very first time in the books and then in the real life. They could see that somebody that, was, that looked like them and that spoke like them with their accent were, were leading these projects and we're now training them. And that makes all the difference in terms of building that confidence, building that self-esteem and so on. Flying Labs have also been involved in public health and um, here was Pfizer and the Dominican Republic Flying Labs using cargo drones to deliver essential medicines. Uh, Nepal Flying Labs uh, was involved in uh, work focused on, on tuberculosis uh, diagnosis. They worked with two regional hospitals and eight remote, very remote clinics using these autonomous cargo drones to pick up patient samples from these eight remote clinics and flying them back. I mean, it's automatic flight, it's autonomous flight back to the two regional hospitals. And so these hospitals for the first time ever went from testing lab samples, patient samples that had been collected weeks ago because of the challenges of bringing these samples from remote mountains back to the regional hospitals to basically testing uh, patient samples that had literally just arrived a few minutes ago and had been basically uh, taken just an hour or two earlier that same day. I mean, it was a sea change for them. It was just something they never uh, expected would ever happen in their, in their lifetime. So it really makes a difference, right? Especially if you're a patient, so you're no longer waiting weeks to find out whether you even have TB, but you can find out now within a day uh, and get the treatment that you need. In <laughs> and so on. Uh, Philippines Flying Labs more recently, uh, this summer has been involved in projects with Pfizer to deliver essential vaccines such as COVID vaccines. And in Uganda, in Lake Victoria, uh, Uganda Flying Labs and many partners have been involved in delivering HIV medicines to different islands. And what I really thought was quite uh, powerful about this project was they were really delivering these medicines directly to the, to the patients themselves. I mean, that was just uh, remarkable to see that being possible. So I'm gonna wrap up with just uh, a, a few a few words on the big picture for us in terms of you know, our end game and our work in uh, trying to be obviously just one of many trying to contribute to systems change and shifting the power. Um, there are three strategies that we're pursuing. The, the inclusive leadership model is fancy word of just basically saying, you know, we as We Robotics have served as a primary enabler um, within the Flying Labs network uh, since the start, but we don't believe that uh, we have a comparative advantage of being that forever. And frankly, if we're going to walk the talk about decentralization, shifting power, localization, then we believe from an activism perspective, 
that ultimately the enabling entity for the network should be one that is deeply rooted in the global south and led by top-notch experts from the global south. This is a, um, an, uh, a project that um, is been going on for two years already with Flying Labs, and we still have far from all the answers. We are partnering directly with an amazing team, the Stopping as Success team, SAS, who have been absolutely phenomenal in helping us and Flying Labs think through appropriate transitions that will be responsible transitions. Um, we still are far from having all the answers. It's still going to be a process but for us, this is something that we're actively exploring uh, directly with Flying Labs and SAS. Um, the inclusive networks model is basically the Flying Labs model that I've just described, that hyper decentralized local first model. This is not a theoretical model. It's not a, a, a speculative model. It is a living, breathing model that has now been implemented in 28 countries, uh, uh, 38 countries <laughs> around the world. And we believe that other organizations and networks might benefit from that kind of model. And so we are working to make that model available to others so that they can adapt and adopt it to suit their own needs, to enable them to be more decentralized and to be more local first. And we already have a first partner that we're working with, a network in uh, Africa that is very keen on creating their network by drawing on the model that has been co-created over the years. And then lastly, um, and then I'll shut up, um, the inclusive uh, power model refers to the power footprint idea that Nick um, uh, mentioned in, in, the, in the introduction. Uh, for us over the years, you know, yes, we've seen how this model that we've co-created has expanded the space for locally led action, for locally led practice, at the same time, we believe that we need to do more as Western INGOs and donors in order to contribute to systems change. And we believe that ultimately we should be taking active steps to reduce our own power, uh, our own power footprints, meaning the uh, amount of authority and control and influence that each of us exert in, in, a, in, a, given, in a given system. Uh, as many others have said for far longer than we have said, uh, until we correct the fundamental power asymmetries that exist in our space, we as you know, international organizations and donors are unlikely to become more effective, more relevant, or more sustainable. We all lose ultimately from these power asymmetries. And we believe that one way to start tackling them is by making them a lot more visible, uh, by taking into account the size of our power footprints and our ultimately our, our dream, our holy grail would be for voters to require their grantees, no matter what the grant is, to reduce their power footprint as part of their grant. Because I don't believe it's acceptable today in 2022 to say that a particular grant has been successful if in the process of implementing that grant, that INGO has, ex has consolidated and expanded its power footprint. That is not success. That's that's BS, frankly. So anyway, this is all to say that we're doing all this. Um, we're one of many in the effort to try and get us out of the bloody stone age of social justice that we are in and trying to make progress in this space. Thank you very much. Higher smart, higher local. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was wonderful, wonderful. Um, so at this point, uh, we have about 30 minutes left. I wanted to open it up to attendees um, to ask any questions you may have for Patrick or any ideas you'd like further explored that were covered in that presentation. Um, I do ask you just raise your hand and then you should be able to uh, speak. So just raise your hand um, if you'd like to ask a question. Genevieve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Genevieve, I'm not, we're not hearing you. So you may have to put your question in the chat. Hassan, how about you? Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you for the very informative and beautiful uh, presentation, uh, Patrick. Uh, my question is, have you ever tried this kind of work in conflict areas uh, to provide this humanitarian assistance? Uh, 
I'm from Palestine, so I, I know the situation there as uh, as an area of, of, of conflict. And uh, how can you avoid having this technology prevented from being, uh, being used in, in these areas? Do you communicate with different like parties uh, to, 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 to stop maybe attacking the drones because they were used in that area as of my knowledge and uh, they were put down? Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much. Um, great, great question. I, you know, I 20 years ago started in this space. I was actually working in the, the conflict, early warning conflict prevention uh, space. Um, and so this is an area that is um, uh, very important to me as well. Um, and I've got to say, even before we were robotics, working in at the intersection of emerging technologies, um, complex humanitarian emergencies and conflict zones, um, I was, uh, how do I not start my own life story here? Um, things can go wrong very, 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 very quickly in very, very, very bad ways when we start using emerging technologies in conflict zones. I think you all know this probably a hundred times better than I do, but I saw some horrific things happening in 2010 and 2011 with the uh, Arab Spring. And, um, I decided to take many steps back because of how things turned out. Um, what's also interesting about your question, Hassan, is because the, the flip side of this is, you know, cargo drones, for example, could play a tremendous life-saving role in conflict zones by being able to uh, bypass certain blockades and, and, and so on. And I was involved in a project that never took off the ground, but it was called the Syria Airlift Project. This was 10 years ago, where we were looking to basically fly in relief supplies from the Turkish side of the border into some enclaves uh, in Syria that were completely blocked off by ISIS. Um, and we had thought through a lot about the, 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 the possible repercussions. You know, we had actually designed around getting away from some of the possible negative uh, um, repercussions that could happen, but it never happened. The, the Turkish government never gave us permission to use their, their airspace. So um, we have not, no, there are currently no flying labs, not because we have had anything to do with this, but no flying labs so far have come from a country that has been recently in a conflict or in a post-conflict situation or active conflict. That does not mean that if we didn't get an expression, that if we did get an expression of interest, we would say, no, 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 no. Again, you know, what we would do is we would clearly share the risks that we have identified uh, very honestly without holding back. Uh, we would share our code of conduct that includes the use of uh, this technology in conflict zones uh, that was developed with the ICRC. But ultimately we believe in the power of local and it's up to the local experts to make their own decision. Uh, we will inform them of all the risks, but at the end of the day, we don't believe it's our right to tell anybody what to, what to use, when to use, what not to use, and, and, and so on. Uh, sorry, that was a long answer, but I really appreciate the question. Yes, I, I uh, let me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll send, I'll send, I'll put a, Hassan, I'll put a link in the code in the, in the chat. Thanks so much, Patrick. And, and Genevieve did type her question into the chat, so I'm going to take that up. Um, I, she was asking about, about gender data in these efforts, and uh, I think that ties into, you know, local, local voices are important, but I think gender mainstreaming of localization, making sure that local women um, are included in these, in these processes and, and building capacity and use of emerging technologies is, I would argue, even more important. Can you share any experience of, of um, flying labs or we robotics overall in, in these efforts? Yes, I can, but obviously uh, I would rather that one of my colleagues <laughs> we robotics do this because they're more involved. Um, um, but I can tell you that, for example, Amrita, who you met uh, from Fiji, uh, she started a program called Fly Like a Girl, for example, really focused on enabling girls to get into uh, this space and to be leaders in, in this space uh, as well. Um, I think all these, this, the following data that I'm going to share is on our website. Um, but you know, the industry average in terms of the drone industry, in terms of um, 
women who are leaders uh, of their own companies, their own startups, their own organizations is something like uh, 6%, I believe. Um, and within the Flying Labs network, if I remember correctly, it's 27%. And so there are multiple, multiple Flying Labs that are entirely headed by, by women. And some labs are all women team. And I can tell you uh, one that comes very close to that is, is India Flying Labs. Um, uh, in fact, India Flying Labs is hosted by an all women uh, university um, in, in, in India. Um, I am not as involved in development projects um, um, so I can't really tell you in terms of, uh, you know, women participation in terms of local communities and so on. Frankly, the best, the best people to ask are the Flying Labs. They're the ones who are leading these, uh, these projects. And we have community engagement guidelines and, and, and trainings as well that, that Flying Labs contribute to and, and give and take that um, take not only, uh, you know, gender diversity, gender balance into consideration, but also other factors, you know, um, for example, uh, uh, disabilities. So Zambia Flying Labs, uh, this is a great story. I think they blogged about it uh, a couple of years back. I've been working with uh, a school of um, uh, kids who are deaf uh, and to, 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 to drones. So this whole community engagement training that Flying Labs contribute to and take and, and give, keep all of that in, in mind, but um, as part of the, 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 the outreach, but unfortunately, I feel like I'm giving you a very high level and that's because I'm so removed from where all the action happens. And uh, if you want an introduction to Amrita, uh, more than happy to, uh, you can talk to her. If you want to talk to any of the flying labs uh, uh, that are led by women like South Africa flying labs, Uganda flying labs, uh, Panama flying labs, flying labs, I'm happy to connect you directly as well. They'll be able to tell you so much more real, um, uh, the reality from, from where they are. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so yes, and just as, a, as a, a housekeeping item, I will be sending out a follow-up email of the session with um, Patrick's contact information CC. So if we wanna facilitate further connections, feel free to, to move forward on that. No, Patrick, that's a, that's a terrific answer. Um, any, any other questions from attendees here? Feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the chat. I I have one, Patrick. Um, you know, I'm really I'm really impressed by this this power footprint concept. Um, but in application, I'm curious. You know, how do you plan to measure that? Let's say in the digital realm specifically. This is something that this community of practice is very oriented. So, how do you think about potential indicators of power when it comes to social media or online platforms? How do we shift those in favor of locally led organizations. And then after that, Paulin can, can say his question. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, we, we wanna figure that out um, together with others. We, 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 this is not necessarily our, 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 our um, core area of expertise. Uh, what we wanna be able to do desperately is to use these metrics, apply to ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to reducing our power footprint every new grant we get. How exactly we're gonna go about doing that is going to be an interesting process, um, um, and which, which has been co-created to a certain extent with, with many different voices and organizations over the past six months. The idea is that there will be three different coalitions um, uh, and during these coalitions, we will go through a, um, a co-creation process of co-creating these metrics together. There'll be an INGO uh, coalition, a donor coalition, and a, do, and, a, and, a, and, a do, and a and a coalition led by global South organizations, right? Um, you go to power.org, there's a link to information as well, and you can see what the idea kind of uh, looks like in, in, in the process. But, um, you know, we deliberately did not move forward ourselves at We Robotics, even though we've been developing, thinking about this idea for a year and a half. Uh, we could have easily just said, you know what, this is the, <laughs> these are the metrics we think we, it needs to be, the, and, and then we'll apply it to ourselves and we'll just go off and do this on our own. We, we felt it was much more important to, to take a, a, a collective community movement approach to all this um, in, in order to, to come up with something that's really, really solid. Um, I was just talking just before this call 
with somebody who's a sociologist and she has worked a lot obviously on power. And so she was intrigued and very keen to, to be involved and to share from her study of power as a sociologist, what she believes is really important to keep in mind in terms of these possible metrics. So uh, that's my answer right now. Thank you, thank you, wonderful. Paul, and over to you. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, um, Patrick. Thank you very much for this very stimulating presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, regarding um, 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 any examples that you may want to share uh, um, of um, Flying Lab um, experts uh, building capacities of uh, local government staff. Uh, you've mentioned a number of times, you know, the issue of decentralizations and also uh, this drive towards uh, shifting power towards the local but we all know that we can achieve you know this much without having local government authorities on board it's important to keep them in mind and therefore I would be you know interested in knowing whether there have been particular examples of uh, flying labs trying to work in partnership with uh, um, sub-national authorities in whatever domain in order to build the capacities and, and uh, to, to deliver better services. And the other question that I have is regarding the specific domain of uh, the protection of uh, cultural heritage. There have been recently interesting developments about the use of uh, tech to, uh, um, um, to help with the the, the protection of uh, cultural heritage items, in particular in a uh, uh, context of uh, crisis. I would like to know whether there has been uh, also interesting um, lessons to um, or um, um, experiments done in the field of, uh, of uh, cultural heritage protection. Thank you, over to you. Brilliant, I love it, um, awesome. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Paula. For I'll take the last questions first. Um, so yes, uh, in fact, uh, Nepal Flying Labs just completed a project recently. I can't wait for their blog post because they shared with me some of the visuals and it's just stunning. They did a project basically focused on, I believe, uh, ancient temples um, to basically, uh, that, are, that are not in the best shape, especially after the earthquake uh, from a few years back. Um, and they used a completely new type of uh, drone technology to do that, that enabled them to get a very, very, very high resolution 3D model of these absolutely magnificent temples as well. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of sensitivity as well uh, with respect to some of these, these, these cultural sites, right? Uh, religious cultural sites as well. Um, and I can tell you that there was no way that a foreigner foreign company could have done these projects. And the, the fact that Nepal Flying Labs was asked to do that by the government is because they built that trust over time, right? Um, so stay tuned. I'm hoping that in the coming weeks, we're gonna see a, a, minimum, a beautiful blog post from Nepal Flying Labs. I also know that a couple of years back, Peru Flying Labs was asked to do, and that, that blog post exists if you go on the Flying Labs uh, blog. Uh, it had to do with an ancient, an ancient rope bridge uh, that I think some ministry in, uh, in Lima had requested Pan uh, Peru Flying Labs to really, um, to, to basically image this, 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 this beautiful uh, ancient bridge uh, before you know, it continued to deteriorate some more. So they also did all kinds of, uh, uh, created all kinds of different information type uh, visuals and products out of, out of that. So, um, so hopefully that answers that, that question. And then yes, your really good question about really flying labs serving as an enabler for local government, municipalities, and so on. I, I, I'm really glad you asked that for a number of questions because one of them is, you know, just like we Robotics serves as an enabler for the Flying Labs network, the idea and the spirit of Flying Labs is for Flying Labs themselves to serve and as an enabler within their own ecosystem, within their countries, to enable their partners, government, universities, you know, local companies to gain those skills, to gain the expertise so that they can also participate in the use of these technologies. And um, uh, 
while I'm also not involved in this particular space with Flying Labs and Robotics, I can tell you, and there's uh, one or more blog posts and there will be more blog posts on this, but um, uh, we've already ran a program called Turning Data into Action program for an entire year with multiple Flying Labs. It was so successful and Flying Labs were so in, um, uh, pleased with that, that they've asked for more. So we've launched a second year of this program. And the entire purpose of this program is for Flying Labs to work with local government, local municipalities, uh, national government, and enable them to understand how to take the data that's basically collected um, using this kind of robotic solutions and then processed and so on and analyzed. How do you take that? How do they, as decision makers within their ministries, their government offices and so on, how do they leverage that to make informed decisions in order to you know, do what they want to do even, even better. Uh, so there's a whole dedicated program there for that. But that is also um, just part of it. Uh, uh, multiple flying labs work with local governments on a, on a regular basis it's, and, and, and have trained local governments on how to use this technology, how to fly drones, how to process the imagery. I mean, that happens on an ongoing basis across these 38 uh, countries. In other cases, local government like in Tanzania, the Dar es Salaam Center for, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, emergency management. You know, uh, what they do is, uh, you know, they've, they've had some introductions, um, but then they, they basically want to basically activate Tanzania flying labs when there's flooding in Dar es Salaam so that they can get the imagery, right? Uh, speaking of, I do remember that earlier this year, uh, Tanzania flying labs was up in Arusha training uh, local wildlife protection experts and organizations on how to use drones for nature conservation and wildlife protection as well. Um, this was part of a, a, a government initiative as well. Anyway, so there are, there are lots of examples, um, some of which I hope you might be able to find on, on, on the, the blog, um, but there we go. Thank you so much, Patrick. I not to turn this into a, a, a business development grilling for me, but I, I wanted to ask, you know, you have a presence in more than 35 countries at this point. What are you currently trying to expand geographically and not just geographically, but in terms of the mandate of, of your organization? You know, what are your priorities in terms of scaling? How do you think all of these efforts can be scaled in a in a way that avoids duplication? Uh well, so, you know, when we set out, when we founded We Robotics, you know, we, we as, as co-founders, we told, we said, we said to ourselves, like, our purpose is not to grow We Robotics. Our purpose is to respond to demand for flying labs and to do so as mm -hmm. best and to the best of our ability and to lower those barriers and so on. So, um, you know, uh, uh, we don't have like, you know, yeah, um, we're not. We don't. We're not. We don't have an, an agenda in terms of, of 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 deciding. Oh, we're going to focus on adding ten new flying labs in Latin America. That's that's not how we work at all. It's, it depends on the demand, and then we respond to the demand, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, right now, uh, where we're at in terms of the stage of you know our organization in We Robotics, we're increasingly looking at. Um, those three strategies, right, of the power footprint, the inclusive networks model, and this idea um, that we are continuing to work closely with SAS, and, and, and I think I saw Ruth earlier, uh, and team is to think through what is the most responsible way of transitioning um, uh, the Flying Labs network so that it's um, being enabled by, by a non-Western entity. Um, and we don't have all the answers. And so we welcome <laughs> as much input and ideas as, as you all have. It's, 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 it's not something that can be rushed. It's something that comes with a lot of risks as Flying Labs have, have identified and quite rightly so. So, you know, um, we, need, <laughs> we need all the help we can get. Thank you, thank you. It's a great response. I, I'm gonna lump two questions together. So first, Catherine put in the chat, can you share any more about risk management and how human partners mitigate against unintended consequence of use of the technology, even outside conflict zones? And then number two, I'm going to hand over to Michael Sadipo. Um, and Michael, feel free to ask Patrick your question. 
Uh, thank, thank you so much for, for, for having me. Um, thank you so much, uh, Patrick, for, for sharing your uh, very insightful um, uh, project and what you are doing. Uh, I just want to know, can you share more and tell us more about the sustainability plans and strategy that you have, uh, having in mind the local groups and how they can take over uh, even when the project is, is, is over? Thank you, Michael. Did, are you specifically interested in in the sustainability the sustainability plans for individual flying labs? How do they remain sustainable? Okay. Um, uh, you're asking you're asking all the questions that my other co-founder are much better at, at answering than I am. Um, so she has uh, been leading uh, a sustainability program uh, at the request of flying labs. Um, in order to enable them to build a build their own sustainability plans, uh, I'm not unfortunately involved in that, so I don't have any wisdom that I can share uh, for that. What I can tell you, uh, maybe a little more superficially, is that you know um, the hosting organizations that joined the Flying Labs, I think I, I, I mentioned briefly earlier, um, are already uh, financially independent. Um, now they joined the Flying Labs for many network for many different reasons, as we've discovered over the years. Um, but you might it might be surprising to learn that that um, some Flying Labs do not join the network for financial reasons. Uh, that's not what they're after. They want you know uh, that's a, they're already you know they already have a successful uh, organization. Of course, what the Flying Labs network enables them to do is access more opportunities, develop further skill sets, making themselves even more competitive, especially compared to Western companies and, 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 and Western um, uh, consultants. Um, and, you know, they bring in their, uh, their own funding. Um, and it's, it, and it's, not, it's, it's, it's often without us being involved at all. Of course, we bring new opportunities, new clients, new this and that, but I mean, they are, like they are entrepreneurs, they, they, they are movers and shakers. They are setting up partnerships with UN agencies, private sector companies, halfway across the world, Korean organizations. And, um, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're yeah. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question in any satisfactory way, but I'm more than happy to put you in touch with my co-founder, Sonia, who's leading the whole sustainability program um, that at any time. Um, and then that was the other question um, uh, from Kat uh, Catherine. Um, unintended uh, risks yes, or yes. unintended consequences, yeah. Yes. Um, so there's quite a bit of that already in um, the community engagement training. And then there's um, this, the risk management is also part of the technical trainings, uh, not just technical risk, but it goes uh, way beyond that. Um, and we have a dedicated person uh, at We Robotics, um, who is based in uh, Arusha, and she is a uh, she used to fly um, uh, what is it uh, flying doctors. Um, I grew up in Nairobi. Flying doctors were very very famous. Uh, she did that as part of her career. So she is a, 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 a pilot, a commercial uh, real airplane, you know, uh, pilot. And then also became a certified drone pilot and her core area of expertise is, is safety. And that is what she is bringing to the flying labs is enabling flying labs to develop that culture of safety in terms of aviation safety with respect to um, the, the technology. Um, and then for uh, flying labs that are interested in get involved, getting involved in humanitarian projects, disaster response, um, I, I, I co-created a comprehensive very comprehensive, detailed training uh, on the use of drones in humanitarian settings. And there we spent a lot of time on risk and risk mitigation strategies and so and codes of conduct and issues around data privacy, informed consent, and, and you name it. Um, um, so that's how I'm gonna answer that question. It's partial. No, thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna, so we're coming up at time. So I'm gonna give you two final questions that I'm, I'm lumping together. Yeah. One is from um, Shachi, and she was asking if you are uh, planning to, in terms of next steps, building digital skill sets in countries to both build flying labs or sustain flying labs as technology keeps improving. 
And then similar, Will asked about, um, he's curious about the role of local technology, uh, the role of local flying labs in identifying new technology needs, for example, beyond drones based on their context. Nice, 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 nice. Um, uh, I, I might need a bit more clarification on such a uh, question, but for the new tech, yes, absolutely. So a number of flying labs are really keen to start working with um, farm robotics, terrestrial robotics being used in, in farming. So we've been re uh, reaching out to a number of different startups around the world to better understand. Um, a couple other, uh, a number of other flying labs have been interested in underwater robotics, underwater drones. And so Tanzania Flying Labs struck up a partnership with a Japanese or Korean robotics company that specializes in underwater drones, which then they got one of their drones, they used it in, uh, off the coast of Zanzibar to do marine life monitoring and, and so on. Uh, Panama Flying Labs is building autonomous cargo boats for transportation uh, and also for uh, data collection as well. Um, so yeah, they're in, and, and Cameroon Flying Labs is building terrestrial robotics for search and rescue uh, and, and things like that. So um, yeah, you know, the, 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 the idea here is not it's just focused on drones, but it's, it's, it's intelligent and autonomous systems. Is, that's the big deal. That's the leap that's, that's happening. That's what's going to reshape society in good and bad ways. Uh, but first, for, for Sachi's a question was whether, whether I envisage flying labs making use of other types of digital technologies, is that, or did I misunderstand? Shachi, you can go ahead and speak. Shachi asked the question. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and thank you, Patrick. First of all, really wonderful to hear you speak. And uh, we connected with Sonia. I, I, I'm at USAID and we connected with Sonia um, on a separate thread. Yeah. And it was really fantastic to talk to her as well. So just super excited about the work you do and uh, always interested in learning uh, where you guys are going. But I guess my, the motivation for my question is, you know, I'm just wondering if you're forming partnerships with other um, actors in the ecosystem. And so I'm, in this particular instance, I'm thinking about like universities or other sort of technical training, vocational training institutions, things like that, so that the rights, like you're over, so, you know, one, <laughs> you have a pipeline of talent that continues to feed into those flying labs, for example, and vice versa, whatever flying labs folks are learning can influence the training opportunities that exist, jobs opportunities that exist in the countries where you work. So I'm just curious about that sort of broader ecosystem engagement around capacity building, because it seems like you have some really talented people already running these, and there's an opportunity to sort of strengthen the just overall technology talent in, in countries through programs like this. Right, right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Shachi. Very, uh, I will try and answer. Um, so uh, a number of flying labs are already hosted at universities. So they definitely have a lot of um, uh, uh, keen and, and very talented students that, that participate. And this includes Morocco Flying Labs, India Flying Labs, uh, previously Panama Flying Labs and, and others. But those, are, those other flying labs that are not hosted by universities, many, I would go so far as saying, the vast majority of them have formal partnerships with one or more universities in their countries. I know that's a fact in, in Peru, for example, I've done a lot of work with Peru Flying Labs, so I happen to know a bit more about um, about that. Uh, the same thing in Dominican Republic Flying Labs. Um, so the, those partnerships get made by the flying labs themselves based on what they believe is in, in a priority of interest, of, uh, strategically important and, and, and so on. So um, we, don't, we don't make those partnerships for the flying labs. They, they make it themselves. Uh, but it, yes, more often than not, every flying labs, uh, Chile Flying Labs I'm just thinking about now, uh, have direct connections with universities, different departments, students, uh, and so on. Does that, I don't know, if, if I didn't answer, we are, I know we're connected on an email already, uh, Chachi, so if you wanted to follow up, I'm happy to. Chachi said, got it, thank you. Well, listen, everybody, we're at time, so we're gonna wrap up, but Patrick, thank you so much. This was, this was a wonderful session. Um, like I said, there will be a number of follow-up items I'll send out, we are recording this. So I'm gonna send the recording link to anybody who would like to revisit um, or share. Second, I will send a few of the linked uh, resources that were discussed in the chat and the presentation. Um, and third, I'm just gonna CC Patrick in the follow-up notes so people can, can resume um, and 
further connect with him if they have additional questions. So uh, just as a final reminder, if you are not on the, uh, the mailing list for the community of practice, just send me a note and I can add you. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and look forward to seeing you all again next month. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Patrick.